philosophy of black nationalism only means that we have to become involved in a program of re-education to educate our people into the importance of knowing that when you spend your dollar out of the community in which you live, the community uh, in which you spend your money becomes richer and richer. The community out of which you take your money becomes poorer and poorer. And because these Negroes who have been misled, misguided, are breaking their necks to take their money and spend it with the man. The man is becoming richer and richer, and you're becoming poorer and poorer. And then what happens? The community in which you live becomes a slum. It becomes a ghetto. The conditions become run down. And then you have the audacity to, com to complain about poor housing in a run-down community. Why, you run it down yourself when you take it down. And you and I are in a double trap because not only do we lose by taking our money someplace else and spending it, when we try and spend it in our own community, we're trapped because we haven't had sense enough to set up stores and control the businesses of our community. The man who's controlling the stores in our community is a man who doesn't look like we do. He's a man who doesn't even live in the community. So you and I, even when we try and spend our money in the block where we live or the area where we live, we're spending it with a man who, when the sun goes down, takes that basket full of money in another part of the town. So we're trapped, trapped, double trapped, triple trapped. Anywhere we go, we find that we're trapped. And every kind of solution that someone comes up with is just another trap. But the political and economic philosophy of black nationalism, the economic philosophy of black nationalism shows our people the importance of setting up these little stores and developing them and expanding them into larger operations. Woolworth didn't start out big like they are today. They started out with a dime store and expanded and expanded and expanded until today they're all over the country and all over the world and they're getting some of everybody's money. Now this is what you and I and General Motors the same way didn't start out like it is. It started out just a little rat race type operation and it expanded and expanded until today is where it is right now. And you and I have to make a start. And the best place to start is right in the community where we live. But don't scare Negroes today with no badge or no white skin or no white sheet or no white anything else. The police the same way. They put their club upside your head and then turn around and accuse you of attacking them. Every case of police brutality against a Negro follows the same pattern. They attack you. Bust you all upside your mouth and then take you to court and charge you with assault. What kind of democracy is that? What kind of uh, freedom is that? What kind of social or political system is it when a black man has no voice in court, has no nothing on his side other than what the white man chooses to give him? My brothers and sisters, we have to put a stop to this. And it will never be stopped until we stop it ourselves. They attack the victim, and then the criminal who attacked the victim accuses the victim of attacking him. This is American justice. This is American democracy. And those of you who are familiar with it know that in America, democracy is hypocrisy. Now, if I'm wrong, put me in jail. But if you can't prove that if democracy is not hypocrisy, then don't put your hands on me. I just told you a little while ago, these leaders that they call leaders, this included Lena Horne, this included Dick Gregory, and this included comedians, comics, trumpet players, baseball players. Show me in the white community where a comedian is a white leader. Show me in the white community where a singer is a white leader, or a dancer or a trumpet player is a white leader. These aren't leaders. These are puppets and clowns that uh, have been set up over the white community and uh, over the black community by the white community and have been made celebrities and usually say exactly what uh, they know that the white man wants to hear. Oh, all power to the people. Hey, welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody. Happy New Year to everybody. We're starting off our political education classes. Yo, this this picture you're seeing right here is from one of the tenants that, we've been, that we helped 
Um, they were trying to kick her out. This video right here was the food that was given away, was giving out food to the community. Or this was presents, was giving out presents during Christmas time to the children in the community. And I guess this is one of the NABPP news with um, General Secretary Patience. Oh, this is our after school program. Pause it. Oh, now nah, this, this is the after school program. We have an after school program on a weekly basis, every day. And, um, and part of that is the boxing. So we added boxing. We don't only have basketball now. We added boxing to one of the programs that we provide the community. Everything that we do is for free. I mean, and on the bottom, these are the col coloring books that we have that we give out to the kids. Welcome to New African Black Panther Party Bobby Hutton Political Education Class. This is week one. Each week, students will be assigned readings and videos to study and will convene once a week to discuss the material, interpret and break down core concept questions and answers, and to prepare for the next week's study material. Remember that taking notes can be really beneficial, even audio ones, and don't be afraid to ask for help. We are all in this together. Each week, you are encouraged to bring the following, quotes from the material, questions you have, your interpretation of material, core concept, revolutionary spirit. The first duty of a revolutionary is to be educated. To be a Panther, we must understand our history, our political line, strategies to overthrow our oppressors. Up upon completion of the political education program, graduates will become members of the UPM. So when you graduate out of the political education class, because this class is 10 weeks, you're going to understand what we believe as Panthers and how we organize in the community to bring about change in the community, not just rhetoric. Um, and once you enter the UPM, after a period of you showing that you really want to be a Panther, then you'll be um, moved up to what you call it, to, um, to becoming a, a new African, new African Black Panther member. But it's steps that you got to go through. But the first step is passing this political education class and going into the UPM where we could work in the community to change people's lives in the community, just like I did in the few slides earlier. I showed you what we do in the community. We're going to get into all of that. Um, you receive recognition and be encouraged to begin organizing. And well, after you graduate, you'll be um you'll be encouraged to begin organizing in whatever community that you're in. Comrade, our studies this week will focus on pantherism, unit unitary conduct, and the enemy. This is a quote from George Jackson. If you're not aware of George Jackson, if you're new to this, um, you're gonna get to learn about George Jackson. Because George Jackson was a great, 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 great um, revolutionary. And you should understand this revolutionary because the state would never allow you to know somebody like this. But this is one of our heroes that they've tried to bury um, mentally as well as they did bury him physically. Settle your quarrels. Come together. Understand the reality of our situation. Understand that fascism is already here. Fascism is already here. That people are already dying who could be saved that generations more will die or live poor butchered lives if you fail to act. Do what must be done. Discover your humanity and love in the revolution. Pass on the torch. Join us. Join us. Give up your life for the people. George Jackson. Who will save us? We will save ourselves. To save ourselves requires getting together by searching out those elements displaying in actual practice revolutionary pro proletarian consciousness and reaching those elements exhibiting all who have shown an identification with pantherism but remain uncommitted though not due to moral flaws that contradict revolutionary panther morality by consciously selecting the most advanced elements from among the black masses for membership in the NABPP PC that's on prison chapter because we're not only organizing out here on the streets with people on the streets. You know, the plantations, the modern day plantations are the prisons. We have to try to organize and work inside our prisons where our, our brothers and sisters are locked up and being and are being oppressed. So the NABPP is not only out for people out here on the streets, it's for those that's also locked up. And we'll have to we have to create 
a prison chapter. The Vanguard Party of New African and African Revolution and a friend to all oppressed people. We are building a cadre of leadership capable of marshalling its energies and talents to move the party forward, even under tremendous pressure from rightist repression. National, national, liber, national liberation struggle fundamentally conflicts with rightist policy. Any vanguard party seeking to lead the people in progressive, aggressive struggle must pre prearrange training for cadre in the basic of protracted struggle in a defensive and offensive class struggle of liberation. That is why we ask all future party members to serve a minimum period of time in the United Panther movement. That's what I was talking about earlier. You have to serve a minimum of at least six months in the United Panther movement, where we're working together in the community to serve the community, which is a mass-based organization that brings in all kinds of brothers and sisters interested in serving the oppressed people and prepares them for revolution. We want to throw the net as wide as possible in order to select from the best of the best. Yeah, when to um prepares them for revolution. Revolution is a no new way of living, a new reality. The way we create that, re we can create that new reality by working together. That's how we create that reality. Rethinking old definitions. We have to, we have to, we have the task of, redefin of redefining in actual social practice the very words brother and sister. The bourgeois definition given to us by our parents must be erased from our consciousness. Bourgeois education and long uses define brother and sister as being based on biolo biology alone for the purpose of discouraging uni unitary social practice by the exploited slaves, sharecroppers, wage workers against the various ruling class forces. The primary determinant of brother and sister springs out of sociological environmental process we call struggle. You know, the hell we catching in our communities about the housing, about police, everything. All the discrimination we feel, that's where our um our kinship come from. If we understand, like when we when when you hear people talk about class struggle, that's what they're talking about. Us understanding what class we fall under, where we're at, and then working together as a group to try to liberate ourselves. It, that's stronger than family relationship. That's stronger. Those bonds are tighter. When we fighting on the front lines together and we struggling together on the front lines, that's that's stronger than any bond that you can have. And once we understand that, then we can move this struggle forward. Take, for example, a group of people who have ideology, values, culture, history, economic oppression, and colonialism in common. We have all these issues in common, like the way we think, what we value, what we want. Our culture is the same. Our history, we understand our history. We understand our struggle to be the same. And we're going through the same economic oppression by the same people. We, once you build an organization or a relationship based on, on that way of thinking, on that way of socializing, ain't no stopping us. Based on this commonality, they organize themselves into a national liberation party demanding freedom. This party or formation will experience the ebb and flow of struggle, including suffering and joy. And out of the struggle for freedom will be forged new, higher relations that will be emulated by other oppressed groups who will also become their brothers and sisters. What do they mean by that? Yeah, we've been doing this. I've been I've been with the Panther movement for a couple of years now. And we put all our energy into what we were doing, following leadership. And at the end of the day, we had to start all over. We had to start all over and bring a new vision to what we were doing. Yo, those were down periods. The last couple of months, like the struggle, the internal conflict inside, trying to deal with the party and the world having to see what we're dealing with in internally, look, that, that's rough. It's hard. I mean, those are the ebbs and flows they're talking about. That is going to be good. It's going to be. It's going. It's going to be good and bad. I mean, but you go through all that bad time, and then when we lose our base, somebody called me. Dewdrop called me and tells me, "Hey, look, Africa, man, you can come down here and use the gym, the um, the boxing gym." to do the program that you're running, to do the program with the kids, the after-school program. Yo, there's no amount of money that can that can, um, that can can overtake that. No amount of money that you have out there. Nothing you can say or nothing you can do like shows that much love 
for somebody to be able to call you and tell you to come use their with their establishment, something that they put their hard blood, sweat, and tears. Hey, yo, do drop, do drop is a legend in the city. If you don't know Dude Drop, Dude Drop has raised a lot of children, a lot of men. There's a lot of people that came through Dude Drop Boxing Gym. And for him to call me, I'm one of them. I went through the gym. This was, Dude Drop was the first person that really brought me in to tell me, like, look, there's other ways to move out here. And started teaching me, started working with me, and became more like a father figure to me. So when he called me and he told me, like, yo, come in and come get the keys. You could get the gym. Like, I, I can't even put into words how that made me feel. I mean, but like, that's what I'm talking about, the ebbs and flows, while you're going through all of that and you all the struggle, the internal conflicts, and then you, <clears throat> you meet people on the streets that's willing on, um, what's his name? What's his name? Um, Rakim Singletary. Like, you meet people on the streets that's willing, like, he has a restaurant that's willing to bring food, to come give you the food for you to give to the people. Like, it reassure, reassures you that what you're doing is right. I mean, so like, but that's what they talk about with the ebbs and flows. This is the period where the very term brother and sister ring from every hall, institution, street corner, house of the newly awakened nation and mean much more than the biological relationship of siblings. If I don't consider you my brother or sister, who are you to me? If we are, if we are of the oppressed class, we ought to be brothers and sisters in spirit and comrades in the struggle for liberation. All power to the people. Like, real talk, like, don't tell me when you see me, tell me, like, yo, I like what you're doing, Africa. Yo, keep up the struggle, man. We, yo, now nah, I need you to join me. I need you to be my comrade. I don't want to be the only one out there, you know, um, what you call it, only one out there dealing with these people. Because, all like, you don't even have to do nothing. All you have to do is, 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 like, hold them accountable. Tell them what they're doing about the housing problem is wrong. And they will, they will make up all kinds of stuff. They'll have a social media social media thing where they're trying to discredit you, trying to make you look like you're somebody that you're not, all because you're trying to hold them accountable because they're ashamed. They don't want nobody to shine the light on them. So they'll come after you. When they come after me, I don't need people telling me, like, oh, keep up the good work. No, I need people joining me in the, on the struggle. Panther love is the glue here. We have to exercise Panther love. We can't state this fundamental principle more clearly than Che Guevara when he said, at the risk of seeming ridiculous, because when you tell people you love them, <laughs> you seem ridiculous in this cold world, because everybody's supposed to be a savage out for themselves. But when you tell people you love them, when you show that you really work for people and, and, and do for people and give your life to people, people look at you like you're ridiculous. Why are you not out here working for some slave master? Why are you giving your time to the people? The people don't pay. You look ridiculous to them in their eyes. At the risk of seeming ridiculous, let me say that the let me say the true revolutionary is guided by a great love, great feeling of love. It is impossible to think of a genuine revolutionary lacking this quality. That's Che Guevara. Like, if you don't know who Che Guevara is, you should read up on Che. You should read up to find out who Che was. Yo, Che came from a rich family. He committed class suicide. Che committed class suicide. I'm going to say it again because he was with a rich family. He was a doctor. He left all of that to fight for the people because that's how much he loved the people. Yo, know, you don't get paid for this. I know he got nonprofits, all these people running around in every city out here. They were working for the city, for the mayor, for the government, and they're acting like they're activists out here working for the people where they're coming for places where people need to snitch and turn themselves in. They got snitching factories all around the community, turning people into the oppressors, and they call themselves activists. They run around blaming the community for what's going on in the community. Yo, listen to them. Listen to all any of these fake activists. They blame the people for what's going on to them, not the institutions and system that are in place to oppress them. I mean, these people don't love the people. They would never commit class suicide. They would never do what they're doing for free. Ask any of these NGO, these fake activists that they have in North New Jersey, anywhere or in, in any of this city. Any activist, any social activist, somebody that say they're fighting for the people and they're getting paid by the government to do what they're doing, they're not revolutionaries. They're not activists. They're hustlers. They're pimps. They're getting paid by the government to keep the people dumb. People like Shay, we're not like that. That's why after years, over 60, 70 years of him dying, we still remember him. We still going to remember 100, 200 years, he's going to be gone. His legacy will live on because he died fighting for the people. It is this abiding sentiment we must uphold with one another. Love should motivate and love should bind us together. 
Let love heal us and straighten us. If you love each other, you give your life for each other. Richard Wolf is an American Marxist econ economist known for his work on economic met methodology and class analysis. Methodology, my bad. He's a professor emeritus of economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a visiting professor in the graduate program in international affairs of the New School. Yale University, well, he went to Yale University 66 to 67, Stanford University at 64, Harvard University, who's on WBAI and several other platforms where he speaks. Now, the reason why he's on here, because he's about to explain to you, because we're going right into this. This is a political education class where you're supposed to understand the system and the society that you're living in. Yo, we are living in a capitalist society. Yo, Richard Wolf is going to explain to you how capitalism works. It's not going to be that long. He's like, he knows what he's talking about. And this is not somebody that I got. They, they, they're like, you got somebody crazy. You're over here. Like the stuff that you're saying is crazy. No, this is a mainstream academic. So this is not Africa telling you what capitalism is. I want you to listen to Richard Wolf and hear what he got to say. Hey, yo, and I need you to take notes because at the end of this, after the 10 weeks, we're going to have the test. We're going to be taking the test. And in the test we're taking, the questions are going to come from this. So, um, so one of the questions is going to be on production, how the how production work in the capitalist system, and that's what he's about to explain to you right here. All power to the people. In Marx's way of thinking, capitalism is easily representative uh, represented in the following way of understanding what the process of production is. And because Marx is interested in human beings, and Marx is interested in how people relate to one another, because that's what he's concerned with, he's going to analyze what production, uh, what happens in production, in terms of labor, of this activity people give themselves to when they go to work, and how they relate to one another as they go about transforming nature into chairs and software programs and haircuts and everything else. Okay? So we're going to start this way. Every act of production makes use of some kinds of tools, equipment, raw material, whatever. For example, let's use a chair as an example. If you're going to make a chair, you need some wood and some glue and maybe some nails and a hammer, and you, you get the idea. And all of those things that are used in production were made by human beings, labor, that's now available for us to use to make more things. Somebody did work a while ago to make the hammer, which I'm going to now use to make the chair. Somebody a while ago put together whatever needed to make the glue that I use and to cut the trees into the lumber that I use. And so we're going to use a simple EL, embodied labor. Every production makes use of embodied labor, labor that's embodied in some product that was done earlier that's now an input to what we're doing now. Basically simple idea. Here comes another simple idea. With this embodied labor, labor embodied in all the tools, equipment, and raw material, production involves the addition of living labor, the worker, you, him, her, the people working. So we're going to call that living labor. Embodied labor plus living labor gives you the total labor in whatever we produce in an economy. It's real simple. Okay? You can say it in other words. There's the value of all the stuff we use up when we produce. Tools, equipment, and raw materials. And then there's the value added by the worker who uses those pieces of equipment to transform the raw material into the fine. So this is nails, glue, lumber. This is the chair maker's effort. And the outcome is the chair. Okay? This is very simple. What is capitalism about? By some process, which we can talk about later, the embodied labor, the work done by working people in the past, becomes the private property of a few people. You know their names. They're called employers. They, got the, they didn't make this stuff. Absolutely not. Somebody else did. Workers. But those workers didn't get to keep what they produced. They lost 
what they produced, and it became the property of somebody else. And that capitalist brings to the production process whatever it is he owns. Let's just say, just to make it simple, that it's worth 100. It doesn't matter what it is. Just 100 of anything. So we know we're using up in making chairs 100 worth of hammers, nails, glue, lumber, all of that. And now the worker adds value to what he or she produces by transforming the lumber, nails, and glue into a new finished thing called a chair or a sofa or any other piece of output. Okay, and let's just to make it real simple say it's another hundred. And so the final chair is worth 200. I told you this would be easy. 100 plus 100 equals 200. Economists think this is an enormous achievement here, but most of you probably don't. The arithmetic is simple. Okay? Now let's follow the logic as Marx did. This is what a capitalist does. He brings a hundred of what he's come to acquire somehow. We don't know the how. And by the way, we never ask the capitalist quite how he got it, do we? It's really only do you got it or do you not have it? And if you have it, you can be the employer. And if you don't, you can't. The fact that the employer who has it didn't produce it is a nagging problem we prefer not to ask. But we'll come back to it. And you know you can't be an employer because you don't have it. You didn't get it. Somebody else did. So the capitalist brings his hundred. But he uses that up. That's the tools and equipment used up. So that hundred shows up in the chair as half of the 200 that chair is worth. And we know that the chair is worth 200 because in addition to the 100 of stuff used up, there was 100 more value added by the worker who worked to make the chair that's worth 200. Now, says Marx, and you're going to say it with me because you're going to understand this. Now Marx says, let's see. For the capitalist, he wants to get back what he laid out, the 100. He gave 100 to the production process. So when he sells the chair at 200, he's going to take 100 of it to replace the tools and equipment and raw materials used up in producing the chair. That's how he can keep on being a chair capitalist. That's how he can keep production going. He has to replace the tools, equipment, and raw materials he used up, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. I don't have the time to be Socratic because we don't have enough time. OK, let's see. So out of the 200 worth of chair, you need to take 100 to replace what you used up. That leaves you with 100 after you sell the chair. What are you going to do with the 100? You could, here we go now, because this is the crucial part. You could take the other hundred and you could give it to the worker. Because after all, it was the worker whose labor added the hundred of value to this stuff to make the 200. You could, couldn't you? And the logic would be, gee, the worker added the value. He or she, here we go, folks, should get it. Because he gave it. He created it. He made it happen. He should get it. Do you think that happens in capitalism? No, you don't, do you? We don't give the worker the value added. Ever in capitalism. It's not how it works. You all know that. But I'm putting it kind of right up front and bold for you to deal with. What is it that capitalists do? They divide that hundred into two parts. One part is what we pay the worker. I'll be generous and say 50. Mm, now you get it. If you made a chair of 200 and you used 100 to replace the tools, equipment, and raw materials you used up, and you used another 50 to pay the workers, that leaves what? 50. Good. Higher math of economics. 50. And Marx called this the surplus. 
It's what the capitalist has left over after he pays out to himself the hundred worth of tools, equipment, and raw materials he contributed that got used up. And he pays the workers. He's got to pay the workers, because if he doesn't, they won't show up anymore and the game is over. So to keep it going, he has to replace the tools and equipment and he has to pay the workers. But he has to pay the workers, here we go folks, less than the value added by the workers when they work. Or to use the technical term economists like, he has to rip the workers off. He has to steal from them part of what their labor added. You know what the lesson here is? For those of you who imagined that when you graduate from here, you will get a job, in fact, the only job you will accept is one that pays you what you're worth. Uh, never gonna happen. The condition of your employment is that you produce more by your labor than you get paid. Welcome to the capitalist system. That's how it works. This thing, surplus, that's profits. That's where the profits of enterprise come from. The best way to describe your work in a capitalist enterprise is not that the employer gives you a job, it's that you give your employer the surplus. The giver and the getter are in reversed order from what the language suggests. You are doing wonderful things for your employer and they will keep you in that job exactly as long as you could keep producing a surplus adequate to what they need. Okay? That's step one. Volume one of Capital lays all that out. And for those of you who have never seen this before, no one has ever done this with you before, this simple, took me five minutes. Now you get a taste of that repression that I talked to you about at the beginning. That's what happens in a society which is not allowed to think like this. So from some of you, maybe it's the first time. Let's continue. What does the capitalist do with the surplus? A lot of things. A lot of things. And they're very interesting and they shape the economy. In order for the capitalist to survive, he's got to take this 50 that he appropriates from the worker who produced it, and he's got to make sure it's distributed in society to keep himself in office, to keep himself in the job, to keep the capitalist system going. He has to take steps to make sure that this stuff keeps on happening. He can't, as you might imagine, take the 50 of surplus and have a wonderful evening on the town going to an expensive restaurant and a lovely piece of theater and then a trip to the Bahamas, uh-uh. He wouldn't be a capitalist very long. He's got to make sure that things are taken care of in this society. Let me give you an example. It's possible that these workers, uh, let me be more blunt, that people like you in a job might encounter a person like me in a classroom which would mean the next day when you come to work, your attitude might have changed. You would be beginning to understand that at the end of the day of a job that you've had, when you had that funny feeling and spoke to a person right next to you on the way out of the building, you feel vaguely, I don't know, ripped off. Yes, good, you got it. There's a reason why you do. You're actually paying attention. Most people in capitalism feel that way. It doesn't show up in the language. We have to disguise it, so we do. Here's an example. At the end of the working day, on your way home, you stop somewhere before you get home. And you stop in a place where you can sit down and have a drink. And the name of this experience in our culture is called Happy Hour to help you understand what the previous hours aren't. <laughs> it's your happy time, because the other eight hours, to use another technical term, suck, don't they? Don't they? The culture does recognize it. It does. 
It just needs a little help interpreting. So it gets distributed, this surplus. You know what it does? It's taken by capitalists and it's given to, I don't know, let's see some institutions who get distributions of the surplus. In many capitalist societies, capitalists support local churches. Mm. And why might they do that? Because in the church, something is taught that says none of what I've just described is going on. Or maybe they fund a university. Maybe they take a part of the surplus and make a beautiful building, sort of, you know, like um, this one. And why might they do that? Because in the university, like in the church, a completely different story is told about all of this. Let me give you an example. Here's a way to understand economics. Production is a wonderful, harmonious collaboration. The worker brings his labor, the landlord brings the land, and the capitalist brings the money and the equipment and the factory. And they all cooperate to produce the output, and then they divide the revenue earned amongst each of them in proportion to the contribution each has made. You might call this fairsies. This is an economics in which everybody is fairly treated. It, it makes you vibrate with the harmony of it all. That's how we teach economics in the United States. I know that because for 50 years, I did that. That's what we taught, because that's what we learned. And that's no accident, because that's a completely different story from this one. In that story, everybody gets in proportion to what they contribute. Fairsies. There's no surplus. There's no ripping off. You've got nobody to be angry at. If you don't have more wealth than you would like, it's your own damn fault that you didn't contribute more. So how can you expect to get more? It's wonderfully comforting. It's like knowing that there's somebody up there who, despite everything else, really likes you even though your best friend doesn't. Okay, it's very important. Here are some other things that have to happen. Suppose these workers, for one way or another, discover they don't like this arrangement. They might decide one day to come into work and say, you know, uh, you're a nice boss and all that, but we're not doing this anymore. You want us to work and add value of 100? We want the 100, because we do it. We add the value. You give us the 100. And the employer says no, and things get kind of ugly. At that point, the employer has an option, very interesting option. He can go and pick up the phone, and he can call a place in town. And he says, you know, I'm getting scared. And very quickly, something interesting happens. A truck or a van leaves an office downtown filled with people in dark blue uniforms who come right to your workplace with a big stick and beat up on these people to help them change their mind. It's called the police. And for the capitalist to do what he does and be what he is, he has to have that phone there. And there has to be a bunch of people in blue uniforms. And there has to be a van. And there has to be an office. And that all costs money. Where do you think that comes from? That's another use of the surplus. But, um, but look, on the test, we're going to actually explain the process of production. This video is going to be posted on YouTube. So if you, don't, if you don't remember what he said, if he went through the process, he'll go back and look at it. Go back and understand the process, how... How this, how production works under capitalism, how we are being cheated of our value. It doesn't matter what you do. I don't care where you work at. Everybody sitting here, it don't matter what job you have. You never get paid with your value. They rob you from the beginning. And then you pay taxes on top of the robbery. That's how the system works. Like, I'm not making this up. So for us to be able to survive in a system like this, we're going to have to create ways for us to be able to live, ways for us to be able to survive. To be free from vampire capitalism requires that at some phase of, of the social revolution, the vampire must be denied the blood of the people to suck. Here's how we define social revolution. The total breakup of the existing system of wage slavery. The political and economic structure of monopoly capitalism has no redeeming values worthy of preservation. No part of it can be used in the new social order we are striving to build. We can't just get rid of every 
we can't just get rid of every vestige of it overnight. Even after the monopoly capitalists are overthrown, aspect of social organized... I can't see what's over here. Let me, I got it, I got it. Even after the monopoly capitalists are overthrown, aspects of social organization of capitalism will linger on for quite a while, and we will have to struggle res resolutely and consciously to root them out and replace them with new socialist relations. We can't stop halfway. The law that protects capitalist existence has lost its ability to be fair and impartial, and so it must face the trash heap with its maker. We can't hate white supremacist oppression, but love is natural outgrowth, i.e. capitalism, which was born from the stolen resources and labor the people of the undeveloped nations um, produce. Capitalist law was instituted and put in place to repress ethnic and national oppressed groups and to protect capitalist property relations. And since 95% of property is in the hands of a few families in America, the law basically protects and serves 5% of the people who make up this ruling class. Remember at the beginning, I told you even the, the people in prison, this is a concentration camp, modern day concentration camps. That's what prisons are. That's the raw plantation of modern days. You know, when you go to court, the, the judicial system is not fair. It's not about justice. It has nothing to do about justice. It's only about money. If you have the money in the class, you could walk out of there. But if you're poor, you're destined to go work on those plantations. New laws and a new constitution will have to be written and amended as we move forward. Laws that reflect and protect new socialist relations, serve the growth of the people power, and prevent a return to the old ways of exploitation and injustice. Hey, Secretary um, General, did I skip the institution video? As this is being written, the vampire ruling class is going through an international in, international fight over economic markets and resources that were divided between individual white nations for imperialist exploitation. No longer do various white nations claim individual undeveloped nations as their exclusive domain to exploit as colonies, but that has not changed the, the drive and zest of former colonizers to impose privatization schemes micromanaged by the World Bank and International Monetary Fund, IMF, and the scramble to control these is sharp. I hope I didn't skip it. Yeah, I skipped it. I'm a, I got I got I gotta go back. I skipped it. I don't know how I skipped it. But let's see. Right here. This is this is very important. I knew I knew I didn't see it. Yeah, it was after this. Who will save us? Basically, we will save ourselves. Like we have to basically you know what I don't even want to keep talking. Um, this video that I'm about to play is very important. This remember when we say we got to take notes at the beginning. I had to bring it back to watch this video right here because this video explains something that's very, very important. It's basically the foundation to all that we are going to be able to do in our communities after we graduate, after everybody graduates from this class and we come together to work in the community. This is a foundation to let you know what we are going to be doing. So I'm about to put the video on. But um, I needed to understand what 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 are institutions? What role do they play in our lives? I mean, so like under like I need you to understand that's what's gonna be on the test. Like, what are institutions and what role do they play in our lives? Let me put the video on. My bad, y'all. Institutions are essential parts of any society. Think about it. Police stations, schools, hospitals, businesses like Walmart and Trader Joe's are all core parts of a community. In a sense, they impose structure on how individuals behave. For example, if all the laws that exist in our community disappeared, would I still have a normal day? <laughs> Probably not. People would be speeding down the street, looting my neighborhood coffee shop, and perhaps a stranger would be sleeping on my living room couch. All the things that I'm used to would be completely disrupted. Maybe a more reasonable example is, let's say all the schools had a new rule of no classes on Fridays then parents would have to figure out childcare for that day. Institutions and their rules definitively guide what we do. You may be thinking that you don't have a kid and maybe you don't need childcare services, but in general, individuals are reliant on the institutions in their community. But is the reverse true? Do institutions need individuals? 
In general, they need lots of folks to contribute to allow them to function, but they don't typically need any one random individual. So there's a bit of an imbalance between institutions and individuals, if that makes sense. While they need individuals and are created by groups of individuals, they will continue even after the individual is gone. The concept of institutions may seem like a daunting idea, but try thinking of them as just a form fulfilling a need. Institutions meet the needs of society by filling expected roles and behaviors. For example, in order for a society to continue, it needs people year after year after year. The family institution makes sure that there will be people to carry on the next generation. We know society needs a way to keep people healthy, so you have the medical institution. And society even needs a way to encourage innovation and progress, so you have universities. There are two views of institutions, a conservative view and a progressive view. The conservative view sees institutions as being natural, positive byproducts of human nature. For example, the institution of hospitals forms naturally from the activities of humans and naturally benefits them. The progressive view takes the standpoint that institutions are artificial creations that need to be redesigned if they are to be helpful to humanity. So perhaps you can see businesses as potentially harming society if they aren't reined in. Now unfortunately, institution is one of those words that has a very different meaning to a sociologist than it does to the average person. We average people might think of just a business or a corporation when we hear the word institution. A sociologist, on the other hand, thinks of social structures when they hear the word institution. They think of governments, families, hospitals, schools, the legal system, religion, as well as businesses. Each of those parts of society continues on without regard to any individual. Governments continue even after the people within them turn over. Families continue from one generation to the next. Laws continue on after the people who wrote them are long dead and buried. Hospitals, schools, businesses, all continue past the time span of any individual and are not dependent on any one individual either. They all power to the people, yeah. So after this, I was supposed to go into this. By consciously selecting the most advanced elements from among the black masses for membership in the NABP PC, the vanguard part of new African and African revolution and a friend to all oppressed people, we are building a cadre of leadership capable of marshalling its energies and talents to move party forward, even under tremendous pressure from rightist repression. So in other words, yo, we all sitting here, the people that's coming into this class to um, to graduate, yo, those are, those are the people that are going to have to build these institutions in the community. Yo, you can't expect everybody to do them. Yo, the government is not going to do it. Their institutions, you send your children there, you participate in all their institutions, they don't work for the people. Their institutions work for who it was built to work for. And those are the imperialists. Like, what, what, what do I mean by the imperialists? Like, when, when, when they're trying to kick you out your house and the landlord, you go into court with the landlord. Yo, 99.9% .9 of the time, the court is going to sign, sign with the landlord. They have more money. They have better lawyers. The system is orchestrated. It's designed to benefit them. And that's why that, that Richard Wolf video, where he was just explaining to all of us how production, how capitalism worked. That was supposed to come after this video about the institutions. So we all understand the um, purpose of these institutions, who they work for. And like he said, when you start protesting at work and you demanding to get more pay, they're going to pick up that phone and they're going to call the police that they have used their surplus money that we all work for in the corporations to make for the corporations. They're going to use that extra money to fund institutions like the police department and the, um, the education department, all these different institutions in the society that they use to put their foot on the neck of the people. Like that's how all of this come together. I mean, and that's why I played that Richard Wolf video for you to get to understand how that worked. But I made a mistake by going too far and you didn't get to see that institution video. So once again, yo, if you don't, if you didn't catch it this time, yo, rewind it back because we're going to post this on YouTube um, tomorrow. Rewind it back. Like one of the questions at the end of the 10 weeks is what are institutions and um how do they function in our community or whatever? Like it's gonna be word worded like that, something like that. Like what is ne neocolonialism? Is the constitution of reimposition of imperialist rule by a state, usually a form former colonial power over an another normally independent state, usually a, a former colony. 
Neocolonialism takes the form of economic imperialism, globalization, cultural role imperialism, and conditional aid to influence or control a developing country instead of the previous colonial methods of direct military control or indirect political control. And that's what he was explaining. I mean, like once we pay our taxes, once we work for this corporation and they have all our money, they use that surplus to pay these institutions, to pay off and buy off these institutions. That's what Richard Wolf is saying. They pay off and buy them off. Now, neocolonialism, like this, they're talking about on a la larger scale. I mean, on, on a global scale, like um, like state from state to state. Example, what's going on in Palestine right now? See, they 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 tell everybody it's a religious war, but it's really neocolonialism. That's what's really going on over there. It's imperialism imposing itself on the people of that land and trying to steal their resources. That's that's the bottom line. That's that's like you don't need to go to school for 20, 30 years. You don't need a master's degree to understand what's going on. Once you understand it from that perspective, everything starts to make sense. Then the crazy stuff that's coming out of the Zionist state of Israel, you understand why they're saying the crazy things they're saying. Because they have to say that. They're true. They cannot reveal to the world their true purpose of being over there to exploit the people and take their land, to kill them, to commit a genocide. They're not there for that. I mean, they're not, they're not going to say that. So with anything that you say to them, if you say anything, they're going to say Hamas did it. Hamas, Hamas. Yo, they call the South African delegations that brought them up on war crimes and shit. They call them, they call them Hamas. They call everybody Hamas. They blow up a hospital. They be like Hamas was there. Hamas was hiding in the backyard. They blow up a little babies. They be like Hamas had them, shielding them as everything. They, they're lying. Nothing they're doing there. They're not going to come out and tell you like we're here, like the American government, the British government, other Western countries are basically paying us for us to be a military base on Palestinian soil. They can't come out and tell you that. They can't. They got to try to hide it. They try. They got to try. They got to pay all this TV station. They got to pay all these people to come out and lie. They got to pay celebrities. Like this is what they got to do to try to, to try to coerce you into believing that what they're doing is right. But um, this is Kwame. Kwame is going to. We did a video and we broke down neocolonialism, and he's gonna. He did a good job breaking it down. I'm about to play the video. Yeah, I was just gonna uh, uh end with something that uh Kwame Nkrumah said in his book Neocolonialism: The Last Stage of Imperialism. He said a state in the grip of neocolonialism is not master of its own destiny. Mm. It is this factor which makes neo-colonialism such a serious threat to world peace. So I just want to conclude with that because a lot of people are always promoting this uh, bourgeois politics. You know what I'm saying? We need more black mayors. We need more black governors. We need more black city officials. We need black more police officers. Well, we see that already in North New Jersey. Like how much more black can it get? And what has that done for the people? That's why uh, Kwame Nkrumah wrote that. He said this is not, he was basically saying this is not black liberation. You know what I'm saying? When it's a neo-colonial state, mm. you're not in the, you're, the, the, the people is, this is not uh, in their hands of where they taking destiny by the horns. You know what I'm saying? It's still being co-opted. It's just using black faces, brown faces, women faces, LGBTQ faces to maintain the same social economic relationships. You know what I'm saying? That was going on before the civil rights movement. When we was just coming out of slavery in the 20s and the 30s and stuff like that, when it was more overt because it was white faces. You know what I'm saying? But just because they got a black face that look just like you and me, they serve the same class structure. And this is what we want y'all to come away with. So you'll understand from a class analysis, everything that uh, Roz Barack, uh, 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 Baraka is saying, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, Obama too, <laughs> I, I almost said his name, but they all the same. But what, what, what we saying, they serve the same class interests. Everything he said, he twisted around. He twisted around and turned it upside down and made himself to be a, like a revolutionary. But like Kwame Nkrumah said, those that uphold neocolonialism in the state, they are not masters of our destiny. They do not control. We don't have, we can't never find black liberation like that. 
You know what I'm saying? So I wanted to end with that quote because he uh, he wanted to quote all these uh, revolutionaries. Well, I'm going to quote them right back to him and say that they said people like you is against the people. All power. All power <laughs> to the people. Now, all power to the people. Um, In that video, he was talking about something that Ross Baraka put out, the mayor of North New Jersey. He had put out a statement against me. I don't even want to go into all of that. But he was really, um, he was um, refuting the mayor's statement when we did this podcast right here. And But basically what he said about neocolonialism, yo, it doesn't matter if they look like us. It doesn't matter if they are us, one of our brothers and sisters. No, it doesn't matter. It's the process. It's what they're doing. It's the political philosophy in which they're following. I mean, like, if you go, like, right now, if you go to Palestine, they have a group over there that's supposed to be political, that's supposed to be fighting for the people. Um, what they, they call them Fatah. They, yo, they got those people bought and sold. Just because those people are Palestinian, they're not fighting for Palestinians. This is the they, those are like the clowns, the puppets. I will fake leadership over here in every city, like any black city, any poor place where black people are at. You have black politicians in position of power, and they're not doing nothing to help the people. That's neo-colonialism. I mean, they look like they're us. They look like they're working with us, but they're not working for us. They're working for the people that pay them for their campaign, the people that pay them to keep them in office, the people that they make these backroom deals with to be millionaires. How the hell are you a millionaire? How is Roz Baraka, the mayor of Newark, New Jersey, a millionaire 10 times over? What did he do? What did he do to become a millionaire? He hasn't done nothing. He was a teacher and a principal, and now he's a mayor, and he's a millionaire while everybody's being pushed out of the city. He cut deals. They cut deals with people. They sell us out for them to eat good and live up in Massa House. And we have to hold them accountable. Who am I going to hold accountable? Because people be like, yo, you, you, you keep talking about the black leadership. They're not leaders. They're traitors. And we need to let our people know that they're traitors and then show our people a different way. But first, you must highlight the contradiction from what they're doing and what must be done. Because they have all the funding. They have access to the people in prison. Like, I want to work with people in prisons. Our organization want to work with people in prison. But we can't open up the, the prison door and go into the jail door, the, the, um, the youth correctional facilities and go in. The mayor does. And he sends his people in there to go in there and just talk rhetoric, to blame the people for what they what the condition that they found themselves in. Because that's what they go in there and tell those young kids. It is the choices that you've made, not the choices that they've made to have the worst schools in the state. No jobs, nothing here to be, no, no, nothing, no institution to teach the children who they are and where they're going and what their purpose is. Everything is to condition them to work on the plantation. That's what they're doing in our communities. And I have to hold them accountable. Who else I'm going to hold accountable? It ain't white people in City Hall. It's not white people that are the mayor. It's nobody else but this neo-colonialist Uncle Tom bootlicking sellouts. Neoliberalism is a term used to signify the political reappearance of 19th century ideas associated with free market capitalism. Hey, yo, people, they just told you. Neoliberalism is a term used to signify the political reappearance. They're bringing that beat back. They're bringing that, they remixed it and they brought it back in the night from the 19th century ideas associated with free market capitalism. A prominent factor in the rise of conservative and libertarian organizations, political parties, and think tanks, and predominantly advocates by them. It is generally associated with policies of economic liberalization, including privatization. Those are the charter schools. When they privatize everything in the community, our homes, everything, those are the, like when they came in with the charter schools, like you got a public school. I mean, they come in with the charter school. Like the charters, they, they didn't tell you the charter school is a public school, but it's really not because you got to you gotta go through a ladder, lottery to get in. Everybody can't get in, so it's not for the public. But they tell you it's a public school. They, but at the end of the day, we didn't ask them for a charter school. Ain't nobody going to the street and marching, like fighting for, for no charter school. Yo, people was in the street marching and fighting from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s. Yo, they were fighting for... Um, to change the curriculum, to be able to teach their kids what reality truly is, because that's the only way you can change it. And these people give us charter schools, and they tell us that's the answer. That's what we've been asking for. So now you got the public school and the charter school. Both of them ain't teaching nothing. Both of them brainwashing our kids. Both of them are prison to school, I mean, school to prison pipelines. 
And we still sitting here thinking these institutions are going to do anything for us. So like you saw the video, it told you about institutions, they, how they're here to control our lives. So like, why don't we build our own institution? It is really that simple. If their institutions are not going to do anything for us, why are we still sending our children to their institutions? Yo, we have, I told you we have the after school program that we do on a daily basis. I run the after school program. Program. I go pick the kids up. And every time when I get there, I ask the children to make sure they have their homework. Yo, 90% of them tell me they don't have homework. I didn't know they stopped giving out homework. I didn't. I really didn't know they started giving out homework. So, like, I'm, I'm there, like, I have an after school program that we're supposed to be doing homework, but the schools ain't giving them no homework. But that's cool, though, because we're going to create the homework. We're going to make sure our kids know how to read. So I'm going to have homework for them. The new African Black Panther Party is going to have homework for them to try to teach them what the schools, these institutions that are not for us, refuse to teach them. Like, that's how you change material condition. It ain't about going outside to go march, begging for policies, running for office. It all starts with building your own institutions in the community together, collectively, as a community. Um, policies of economic liberalization, including privatization, deregulation, they like they deregulate everything. They just let these comp companies do what they want to do. Globalization, free trade. I don't even know why they always say free trade. There's nothing free about the trade. Monetarism, austerity, and reduction in government spending in order to increase the role of the private sector in the economy and society. The defining features of neoliberalism in both taught and practice have been the subject of substantial scholarly, scholarly debate. It ain't really a debate for me. Like, we already know what it is. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, World Bank, and other banking and financial leading institutions have come up with a slick way of reimposing control over undeveloped nations by neo-colonial rule that consists of economic exploitation, economic aid, public government, and military assistance. Everything we're talking about. Though the U.S. ruling class has emerged as a victor in this international fight, monopoly capitalists from all over Europe, Japan, and elsewhere are moving their capital overseas to markets with cheap labor and no labor laws so they can make a huge profit on their investment. Following the law of the, maxim law of the maximization of the rate of profit, we must oppose this by international solidarity and struggle, sowing the seeds of world socialist revolution. And we must remember what V.I. Lenin said 100 years ago. There can be no equality between the exploiters, who for many generations have stood out because of their education, conditions of wealthy life, and habits, and the exploited, the majority of whom, even in the most advanced and most democratic bourgeoisie republics, are downtrodden, backward, ignorant, intimidated, and disunited. Basically, what Lenin was saying was, yo, they've always been up top. The ruling class has always been up top. I mean, they're not going to change who they are. We got to change how we move. We can't, have, we can't trust them no more. We have to basically build our own institution. That's the only way that we are going to be able to liberate ourselves. That's what Lenin basically said in his quote. But I'm about to play this video from King. It's not that long. I think it's about two minutes long. But he's going to be saying almost the same thing. And say God sent us back. We don't have to argue with anybody. We don't have to curse and go around acting bad with our words. We don't need any bricks and bottles. We don't need any Molotov cocktails. We just need to go around to these stores and to these massive industries in our country and say, God sent us by here to say to you that you're not treating his children right. And we come by here to ask you to make the first item on your agenda fair treatment where God's children are concerned. Now, if you are not prepared to do that, we do have an agenda that we must follow. And our agenda calls for withdrawing economic support from you. And 
So as a result of this, we're asking you tonight to go out and tell your neighbors not to buy Coca-Cola in Memphis. Go by and tell them not to buy sealed test milk. Tell them not to buy what is all the bread, Wonder Bread. And what is all the bread come to dressing? Tell them not to buy hearts bread. As Jesse Jackson has said, up to now, only the garbage men have been feeling pain. Now we must kind of redistribute the pain. We are choosing these companies because they haven't been fair in their hiring policies. And we are choosing them because they can begin the process of saying they are going to support the needs and the rights of these men who are on track. And then they can move on town, downtown and tell Mayor Lowe to do what is right. Now, not only that, we've got to strengthen black institutions. I call upon you to take your money out of the banks downtown and deposit your money in Tri-State Bank. We want a bank-in movement in Memphis. Go by the Savings and Loan Association. I'm not asking you something that we don't do ourselves in SCLC. Judge Hooks and others will tell you that we have an account here in the Savings and Loan Association from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. We are telling you to follow what we are doing. Put your money there. You have six or seven black insurance companies here in the city of Memphis. Take out your insurance there. We want to have an insurance in. Now, these are some practical things that we can do. We begin the process of building a great economic base. And at the same time, we are putting pressure where it really hurts. I ask you to follow through here. Now let me say as I move to my conclusion that we've got to give ourselves to this struggle until the end. Nothing would be more tragic than to stop at this point in Memphis. We've got to see it through. When we have our march, you need to be there. If it means leaving work, if it means leaving school, be there. Be concerned about your brother, you may not be on track, but either we go up together or we go down together. Let us develop a kind of dangerous unselfishness. All power to the people. No, but that's what he was saying. That's what Dr. King was saying. Like, just listen for the next week. Everybody's going to be talking about Dr. King. They're going to be talking about voting because all the people that you're going to be listening to, what's up? All, all the all the all the people that you're going to be um, what you call it, that you're going to be listening to, they're going to be telling you about voting because it's election season. They're going to be telling you about Martin Luther King. Say we should all live together. This, that, and the third. Little white white boys and little white black boys. 
King is telling you right there, you must pull out. This was like one of his last speeches where he was saying, like, we have to build our own institutions. You can no longer trust these people. And at the end, he said, you got to be concerned about your brother, your comrade. You have to be concerned about them. How did, however they're treated, you have to feel the same way, like you being treated that way. Yo, he said, miss work. Because like in today's in today's world, yo, you people don't want, you can't, yo, you cannot look to people to miss work for anything. Ain't nobody trying to miss work to go do nothing that's an organization. But yo, but how are we going to organize to get off the plantation if you're not willing to get together to organize, to get off the plantation, to build an underground railroad? Because that's what we are here for. That's what we, that's what this political education class is here for, to get you to understand that we need to take our resources from them and use it amongst each other in all our communities. Yo, I have people here from all around the country. We have some people on here that are college students, high school students. Wherever you're at, it is our duty to build organization with people in that same space, to build institutions in those spaces. That's how we change our condition, our material condition. Because how are you going to keep sending your kids to school where they're not even learning how to read? And you think you're, we're going to change anything, that we're going to get um, revolution anywhere, unless you build institutions in that community to teach our own kids. So-called leftist movements still haven't caught on to the statement from 100 years ago. That is a telltale sign of class collab collab collaborationism that our party will expose to the people. We'll have, we have to build our party beyond national boundaries of the United States, wherever Black people are concentrated, and particularly in Africa. In this way, we can help to unify the political consciousness of our people and coordinate our struggle against imperialism, neocolonial exploitation, and racial discrimination and oppression. Yo, our struggle is universal. I mean, so like you see some people, they're like, yo, man, I don't care about Palestine. I mean, they, they don't care about me. Palestinian people don't care about me or about our struggle over here. Well, maybe the average Palestinian person don't care about your struggle. But those that are in the struggle, those that are fighting for liberation, yo, they got paperwork already, man. They've been writing books since like the 60s, since like the 70s, saying that they are our comrades, that they that they fighting with you. Just like they struggle, they understand their struggle is an imperialist struggle. And they understand our struggle here is an imperialist struggle. You go all the way back to U.P. Newton, Malcolm X, everybody, even Dr. King that was just speaking, everybody understood the Palestinian people were being oppressed. And they stood on the side of the Palestinian people. So yeah, most of the, the black folks that you see outside, they probably don't even know where Palestine is. But that don't mean like Palestinian people should think black people not with them, because I'm with them. All real organizations fighting for the liberation of all people are with Palestine and stand in solidarity with Palestine. I mean, I may not agree with the strategies in which they use it to, to stand with them. That's a story for another day. But we all stand with them. We all stand with the Palestinian people. And if you don't stand with anybody that's been oppressed by imperialism, then you don't belong here. You don't belong in our circle. I mean, because you're not, you, you're not with the um, people that are being oppressed. If, and if you're not with the people that are being oppressed, then who you with? And who you with? So long as we are oppressed and discriminated against as black people, there will be no, there will be a need for new African Black Panther Party and for pantherism. Together with our oppressed brothers and sisters of all ethnic and national backgrounds, we must rise as a mighty storm of struggle to sweep away imperialism and, and all oppression. All of us. See right there? It's like you like it's just black people. No, like Black Panther Party is everybody in the community. Yeah, I'm black. I'm black. Most of the people I know are black. The people around me are black. So yeah, we are the Black Panther Party because we black. Like it's no secret around that. But in right now in 2023, what we're doing here in our communities, our communities is just not only black. And this is bigger than just a racial thing. It's about everybody that's in the community. Remember, intercommunalism, all communities. Whatever community that you're in and you're being oppressed by the government, by the state, by imperialists, yo, we're supposed to come together, those that are being oppressed, to build institutions that serve us. Um, yo, see, it was yo, that was quick. That was real quick. That's like an hour. Yo, next week assignment, be prepared, review material. Um, the first Rainbow Coalition documentary is right here. Hey, when we put this on YouTube. Are they going to be able to hit these links to see these videos? Yeah, because the power.
The PowerPoint is going to be on our webpage. Oh, power. Yo, the PowerPoint is going to be on our webpage. So you could go on our webpage and you could watch this um documentaries. So we don't have to watch all these videos. And it's not nothing that you really got to read. You just watching the videos, man. Watch them when you get your little spare time, commute, whatever you're doing. You got a little bit of downtown, downtown on um, watch this video. So we talk about it next week when we come to class and we don't have to go through the whole video. But it's really important for you to watch this video for the class next week. And remember what we talked about this week with the stuff that we went over. Um, what is this? Announcements. You want, well, you, I'll do the announcement. Now, our survivor program, Um, we're doing the political education um course, which that's what we're doing right now. Um, Housing advocacy, we're working with tenants. Whoever, yo, if you need help, if they're trying to kick you out your home, they're trying to push you out. Yo, we understand how they're doing this because we've been doing this stuff for a couple of years now. We've been working with people, helping them stay in their homes. So if they're trying to push you out, you'll get in touch with us. General Secretary Patience, that's what she do. She handles these stuff um 24-7. Yo, she got a job too on the plantation. But when she get off the plantation and she comes home, she spent about three hours, three, four hours working on people's cases and helping them go through the system to try to stay in their homes. This is our cash app. If you want to help with anything that we're doing, let me go back to the front. Because everything that we're doing in the community costs money, but we don't look to the government. We're not begging the government to give us anything. Everything that we're doing, we fund it out of our own pocket. We ask nobody for anything. Like, um... Like when we're helping people with the housing, this like look at this condition somebody was living with. This is a young lady that was living through like she had like four kids in the house. And this is how our her apartment was. And they were trying to kick her out. But all this food, all this stuff, um, the food was donated. This food was donated by Rakim Singleton. That's his, let me put that back. Let me put that back so you can see it. Right here. This is his business right here. So if he support the Panthers, if he support the community, you should support him too. Real talk. Like, you should support him. This is his business. He's on Springfield Avenue. The number right here, 862-902-6553. Yo, call him up. Hit him up, man. Now, and the food is real good, too. It, like, Poppy was over there. He was hitting that thing in Dominican Republic. He was hitting it. He was, what was it? What was it? He was Spanish. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was talking in Spanish. He wasn't even saying the English, saying the food rocking. Like, you see, that's why I'm smiling, because he was he was spitting that thing. But anyway, let me see what else um, yeah, we have the Black Panther on weekly news. We're going to have news. We got news that come out weekly. Well, almost daily. Um, yo, we got to feed the kids, yo. When we have these programs, yo, we pick them up. We got to feed them every day. Yo, the meals alone, man. The meals cost like, how much, how much, how much it costs to feed, to feed? Anywhere from 50 to 100 a day, depending on how many kids we have. Uh, yeah, 50 to 100 a day, depending on how many kids we have that pull up. I mean, but like, we're not going to wait for nobody to do it. We're going to do it. And we're not giving them like food that they give them at the school. Now nah, we, we try to give them like a real meal. When you come there, every day that you come to the boxing program, to the after school program, you're going to have a real meal before you go home. We take them home. We drive them home. All this stuff is out of our pockets. There's no nonprofit, no NGO, no government, no politician, no celebrity funding anything we do in the community we do it amongst ourselves but just picture if all of us was invested and we were involved in it, doing it together just imagine the impact we could make but but that's it for this week you have anything general secretary no, 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 um continue to talk let you know how no oh hold on yeah, yeah, yeah. yo before everybody leave real quick but the where's the um hold on, Go ahead, keep talking. I just want to copy oh, I gotta unmute, uh, man. Hey, 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 Shay Coulter, you still there, Shay? You there, Shay Coulter? Yes, brother, I'm here, man. I'm here. And I actually uh I learned some information today, man. You took me back to uh <laughs> the means of production and some stuff I actually grew up around. It I haven't looked at that material, man, in 25 years after. All power, all power. No, yeah, but that's I respect the path that you're on, man, with this educating and Miss Patience and the other comrades that's on the uh call, man. We're all uh this will be my first time going through this uh curriculum. I used to hear it Africa on the uh in the neighborhood by my grandmother's building in Harlem by Colonel Charles Young Park. So it'll be like 30 brothers like you, but they would just snatch us up like, you know, this is what you need to know. This is comprehensive education. And I have deviated into like the political world, but 
I kind of begin to step away from it because it touches on exactly what, what you and the other brother were touching on. This uh, neo-colonial plantation is, is a much more complex thing. It's reverting back to everything from the 18 and 1700s, right in front of our face. All power. But All power. they disguise it so well, if we're not alert, they'll have us divided and confused. Oh, and we're not going to let that happen, man. So oh, I'll be uh, here at your school to support you and learn as one of the students. All power. All, right? All power, Shay. Hey, yo, like, and hit me on, on message to DM me. Hey, yo, like, those will, man. Yo, we need to have those conversations like here. With everybody that's here, we need to have these conversations and understand what's going on in our community so we all, we could all do this work together. That's the only way we're going to do it. But thanks for pulling up, Shay. All power. Conference. No problem, man. No problem. And tell Poppy I said hello. All power. All power. Hey, Tracy, what's up, Tracy? I'll see you right here, Tracy, New Jersey. I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm just giving my shout out to everybody here. If you don't, if you don't want to speak, you ain't got to speak. I'm just saying. Yeah, I'm here. How you doing? I'm, I'm good. So everything, any questions, anything good? No, this is stuff I, I, I know, but you know what I'm oh, saying, power. that uh, the group that I've been has been dissolved. Oh, power. Um, so, so I want to try to bring back into the Brunswick. That and I'm, I mean, I'm remember I'm 59 years old now, so you're 59 I'm years young. young. Don't nobody want to hear that. You got some knowledge, yeah. you got some knowledge to part to um, <laughs> the impart to give us. You have knowledge, yo. you are a valuable asset. No, cut it out. Hey, Tracy, um, put just put some information in the group chat so we could reach out to you during the week. Yes, I used to be part of the the mayor father group, oh, power. Uh, communist. Um, Remember the communist urine? Yeah. Yeah. I uh, used to be oh. part of the father group. Oh, power. Long time ago. And and I was the New Brunswick officer. Got you. All power. Yeah, okay. I, yeah I'll put my information in the, uh, in the chat. No got problem. You. Thank you. Got you. Hey, well, I see some people on here. Look, I don't want to pick you because I just thought about that. I remember. I don't want to pick you if you don't want to be picked. But I see some people. I see you up there, Peso. Ibram, Ibram Tan, I see you. If you want to say something... Yo, the floor is open, man. I mean, I've been speaking for like an hour and twenty something minutes. If anybody want to say something, like go ahead, um, like unmute yourself. You you good? You got it? You got it. Hey, yo, what, what up? Yo, the, yo, this class was so good. I got people falling out their chairs. But look, um, Kimora Hall, iPhone eighty six, iPhone. <laughs> Gabriel, anybody want to say something? Go ahead. You can say a few things. You want to say something? Yeah, if there's anything going on in your community you like to share, please let us know. If there's anything you need help with, if you like to share with us, please let us know. Please, um, our after school program is open to all the student, all the kids in the community. If you know any kids that want to join the after school program, please hit us up. Thank you. All power, all power. Yo, Ibram, you got something? You got something for me? Oh, now who's that? Who's about to say something? That's me. That's me, brother. What's good, Africa? It's Manat. What's up, man? All power to the people. I got oh, your wow. message, man. I, I know I've been a little MIA, you know what I mean? But I, I just want to make sure I was here tonight because you hit me up and it really seemed like something. I, and I'm glad. I'm glad I was able to be here tonight and just listen to everything, bro. Brother, thank you so much, man. Like, just thank you, man. Oh, what wow. you're doing is just, just like, I got to give you your kudos, bro. Like, you're, you're bringing people together. It's the, it, the the platform, your the message, bro. Thank you, man. It means a lot because I, I've literally been speaking about this, so a lot of the things that I heard said tonight, and just just to have that stuff reinforced, and just especially on a day like tomorrow too. Like, and I, I was even talking to my son. You know, you have the day off, but like it's Martin Luther King Day. Mm. All right, like when you're home from school. We're like, what are you? You're gonna learn something. This ain't a regular. This ain't them holidays. Is hot. Those ain't real holidays. Like make this mean something, you oh, know, man. and like this is a beautiful thing. Thank you so much, and I, I'm really gonna connect. I'm gonna see you soon, but like I, I wanted know. to make sure I was here. Cause but let me tell you, let me tell you, hey yo, I got the boxing gym, bro. That's our new base. I need you to come in there to help me train these kids. Oh. I mean, I got you. I yo, got you. I, mean, I got you. Talk. I mean, so like, bro, please stay in tune. Hit yeah, me. Yo, it's crazy because I just got my, I just got into a facility just now, starting January. Yeah, it do, and I didn't have that. So like, it's been a whole new dynamic and I've been trying to like, make sure I get everything together. So it's funny you said, but I remember we were speaking about that. So I got you, I got you. We're gonna, we're gonna chop it up. I got you, no problem. Say no. Look, cause look, whatever facilities you, whatever facility you got, 
yo, once we graduate, you ain't even got to wait to graduate. Whatever help you need, yo, we're going to be here to um, offer that help. You feel me? Yes, yes, yes. And I'm going to need some, I'm definitely going to need some help. We're going we to talk. Yeah, it's, it's a yeah. beautiful thing, man. All power, all power. Like, I got you. All power to the people, man. And just to everyone else that's listening in here, man, let's all just stick together, man. Let's all, all just power. stick together. All power to the people. All love, man. Have a good night. All right? You too, comrade. Yo, all right, comrade. Yo, if anybody else don't have nothing to say, I'm about to end this because we've been in here for a minute. Now I won't put nobody on because I could keep going and calling names, but I won't put nobody on blast. I don't want to speak. So, like, yo, talk to me. Tap in. Going once. Going twice. Hey, yo, we'll see you next week, Sunday, man. And if you got anything, anything you want to talk about, yo, when we come here, this is where we talk about it and we explain it to each other. Yo, we believe in um ideological struggle. I mean, we believe in that heavy. We are heavy on ideological struggle. So till next time, all power to the people. Just hit end, right?